Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Sylvia Garcia, Letitia Van de Peet, and Judith Safarini. Good to see you. Thank you. Put you right over there. Thank you, ma'am. Good thank to see you. Put you there. Senator, thank you very much. Good to see you. Please welcome to the three of you. Thank you for being here. So we are fewer than 60 days from the end of the session. A lot of work still to do, but I think we have a pretty good sense of what kind of a session it's been so far. And there are a lot of people who think it's been, relative to expectations, a kumbaya session. Not a whole lot of soap opera drama in the Senate, people getting along, uh, very few votes that have been super contentious, unlike that uh, messy house. Uh, I wonder, uh, Senator Van de Pute, if that is your impression from the inside of how things have gone so far. I think having a focused agenda and emergency items that aren't uh, toxic. You know, when you start out a legislative session and uh, there are egregious uh, themes uh, with regard to sanctuary cities, anti-immigrant, voter ID, uh, for us uh, last year, the, the sonogram bill, the themes right. that were uh, in a, on the emergency calendar that we addressed at the very beginning, really I think set a tone that was uh, divisive. And of course, you know, the, the revenue situation from last time. But I think elections matter. And yeah. we are not seeing that, that type of legislation that would put us uh, really divided at the very beginning. We're working together because we're focused on the job at hand and not on the items of the periphery that are just uh, political rhetoric. Senator Zaffrini, in fact, it was noted by a lot of us that there were no emergency items this session, unlike last session. Senator Van Depute named a few that definitely blew the Senate and the House both up. But we started off without emergency items. There haven't been a whole lot of divisive issues put before all of you, so maybe it's not that surprising that it's been relatively calm. That's exactly right. That yeah. has made all the difference in the world. Yeah. And the fact is that we have been able to focus on the priorities that matter to each senator. Yeah. And Governor Dewhurst has let the Senate be the Senate. And each senator has had the opportunity to focus on priority issues such as higher education, early childhood education, transportation, the environment, whatever is important to that Senate. Right. And even in the Finance Committee. Last session, there were a lot of controversies related to finance. This time, under Tommy Williams, each member of the Finance Committee has been free to address the priorities of that particular senator relative to funding. Is that the different senator that it was Ogden then and it is Williams now and so there's a new sheriff in town? Is that what it is? Well, it's been wonderful. It's been absolutely wonderful. Not only has Senator Williams done a wonderful job, but every subgroup leader yeah. has also done a wonderful job. And equally important, the witnesses have been terrific. Yeah. Witnesses have offered compelling testimony. Last session, I had the impression that there were some witnesses who had been ordered by the powers that be to hold back. The powers that be meaning their own bosses. Right. And we felt that they weren't communicating with us effectively and honestly. Right. This time, they did. Not so. Yeah, they not were so compelling, so. they were honest, they were thorough, they were wonderful. Great. To give you a perfect example, yeah. tuition revenue bonds. At the beginning of the session, key members of the Senate expressed opposition. There were people who said, TRBs don't have a prayer. Yeah. The presidents of the universities were so thorough and so convincing in their testimony that we're having the hearing at nine o'clock today. Right, they turned some, they probably today? turned some, some points of view around. Absolutely. Uh, Senator Garcia, you're new to the Senate, but not new to public life. Oh, you, you've noticed. I, ha I, I have, <laughs> but you, I, I think that you have some perspective a little bit different from Senator Van Putin and Senator Zaffrin. You've been outside the Senate for, for a long time, and so you've been able to observe it from the outside. Is it different than you thought it was gonna be in the 30 days you've been there in terms of how people have been able to get along? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for putting this nice anniversary breakfast uh, for me together. All for you, Senator. <laughs> thank Senator. you so much. It, yeah. it helps me kick off my, my 30th day. Okay. Um, it's, um, it's different than I expected, only in the sense that, that I find it a little bit different than all my previous positions. I think I've been very impressed with the level of collegiality. Yeah. Uh, by example, I, I probably had one or two meals perhaps with all my colleagues and commissioners coordinating one given time. Uh, and in the Senate, we do that every day. I mean, I think that really helps communication. Yep. Uh, I think it's different um, because, in, an, in another way, because uh, as commissioner, I had the ability to put any item on the agenda that I wanted for my precinct and, and for my, my priorities. Uh, here, it's different because you really don't. You've got to go through a process to do that, right. but it seems to be open and fair for the moment. Uh, for me, it's, I have not been able to file, I haven't filed a bill yet, 
but I think everyone is, is ready for me to do that next week so that they can suspend rules and allow me to do it. Give you an opportunity to play. Yeah, correct. Right. And I've been able to, to um, t tag on to other bills. I've been able to um, do an amendment. So right. I think everyone has been more than helpful and it's been, been very welcoming. So it's uh, been a good 30 days. First, first start. Good. Uh, Senator Van let me come at this in a different way. So I said it's been kind of a kumbaya Senate. Another way to look at that is, is that a lot of us expected with the departure of the five senators and the arrival of Campbell and Paxton and Taylor and Hancock and Schwartner, that the Senate would be as a body more conservative than it was last session. And there might be actually some more issues on which the divisions were clear. Uh, we had Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst come off of a Senate race in which he was perceived by some in his party to be insufficiently conservative and therefore many of us assumed he would have to prove his conservative bona fides in this Senate. And uh, Senator Zaffarini, your removal as head of the Higher Education Committee, the installation of Senator Patrick as the head of the Public Ed Committee seemed to confirm that, that Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst might actually faint right this session. But in fact, it seems to me that the Senate has not behaved in a way where the party politics or the partisanship has been really out front. In fact, see, there seems to be an effort to, to agree and get along a little bit more on a lot of issues. There were only two no votes. We'll come to you, Senator, as to why you were one of them on the budget. Uh, there seems to be general agreement about water. There even seems to be general agreement in, uh, in opposition to some of the uh, public ed proposals that have been put forward. I mean, it's, it's not a, a real polarized session, Senator. Why is that? When you're facing a big election year with uh, the presidency and a lot of the U.S. Uh, seats up, whether it's the Senate, uh, all, of course, all of Congress here, folks um, have to make their statement. But Evan, I don't know how we could be more conservative than the horrendous budget cuts that were taken last legislative session. I think that what you see in the Senate is it was a brutal session. Yeah. It was toxic. It was, uh, we work together. Uh, we know each other's families. We know each other's children and spouses. We really do work because we're only 31. What happens when you get things that tug at your heart, that rip you apart. Yeah. Uh, and that's what happened with a huge amount of the anti-immigrant uh, themes that were brought up, the legislation that was brought up uh, last legislative session. You know, it, there are certain issues that you understand, that it philosophically, politically, um, how senators are going to fight for those issues. People are going to see the world differently, that's right. That's right. Yeah. They represent different districts, and we're a very diverse state. And I think we respect that because we understand that how tough it was for us to get to the places that we are in the Texas Senate, and we respect the fact that whoever it is that got elected from that district, they had to go through that too. Right. But if you put undue priority yeah. on those issues, which really don't affect Texas families, that water infrastructure, transportation, yeah. education, and so education, the, you know, the, the infrastructure of opportunity. That's what we needed to focus on. I think that we've really focused on that and sure, we're probably coming to the point where we might see a few of those issues that are very divisive come up. I think one thing that could absolutely throw a wrench in this is if the Senate decided to take up redistricting. Uh, you know, whether or not what happens at the Supreme Court, if we are led to, you know, we've got to do this, it adds something that is cumbersome in a process that really is not necessary. Do you have any reason to believe, Senator, that that's going to come back up? I hope not. There has been discussions, and as you know, the Attorney General has, uh, has made the opinion that it might be a good idea for us to come and, and uh, certify past legislation that would uh, keep intact the current lines. Uh, but the Supreme Court has not acted, and, yeah. and, and uh, it takes away the priorities, and you know what happens in a legislative session when you've got redistricting. Just the mere fact that it sucks the air out of the room, it diverts our priorities, and there's so little time. 140 days, you've got so much political capital. If you're having to expend that on something that's not really relevant at this right. point, then you, you diminish what is the real work at hand. Right. Senator, that would be an issue, you know this issue well, this is an issue that would probably cause those partisan lines to harden again. but. Putting that to the side, there haven't been very many issues in which Republicans and Democrats have really been at incredible loggerheads. Well, there haven't, but the fact of the matter is that the issues have been there. 
And the difference is that there are more members of the Senate who are willing to work together yeah. and to collaborate in reaching a consensus. For example, some of the health and human services bills that right. might have been passed along party lines before, yeah. this time we went through a collaborative process and we improved the bills, yeah. we reached consensus, and we have more support for them. Right. Even the budget, only two no votes. Right. How many no votes were there last time? Right. But you know what's made all the difference in the world? There was no serious, effective attempt to overturn the two-thirds rule. And we have 12 Democrats. So by starting the session yes. without Absolutely. Undoing the tradition so, of the two-thirds We need 11 rule, votes to right. block. You need yeah. 21 votes to bring up a bill. So we you have all, And you Democrats. all have enough, so there's a, a, an, an impetus for some kind of collaboration. So we're at the table, right. and we can be effective, and yeah. we have an impact on legislation. We have an impact on the budget. That's made all the difference in the world. Right. Now, Senator Zaffarini brought up, as I did, Senator Garcia, the, the fact that there were only two no votes on the, on the budget. You were one of them. Uh, you had campaigned effectively in a way that telegraphed if you got elected, this is what you're going to do. But I'd like to give you an opportunity to explain yourself because Senator Zaffarini, Senators at Vandepute, good Democrats, people who share your values and ideas, uh, found a way to support the budget, but you didn't. Could you explain Well, that? I just couldn't say yes. I, again, you, you've said it. Um, I came fresh from a campaign where the priorities for my district were education and health care and good jobs and, and concerns about immigration reform. So I came, came to the job here and I had had a budget this thick delivered on Thursday and I was expected to vote on, I think it was Monday. Uh, there's no way humanly possible that I could pour through all of it. I mean, I, it's a question of time also. I got a couple of briefings, but the things that mattered the most to my district, which were uh, restoring all the cuts to education yep. and expansion of Medicaid was not there, so I just could not vote uh, for the budget. Of course, the Senate did put back in a billion five on Correct. the public education side. The House has put in two point five but billion. Evan, you all, yes. We cut but four point five billion dollars last year. In the time, last, so. yeah, well, un understood, Senator. But it's but still not enough. It, so, yeah. so you're, the only way that you would have been comfortable with that budget was if they restored the full amount of. And the we had done session. something about expansion of Medicaid. Right. And uh, I have to tell you, Evan, yes. had I been in her position, yeah. I would have done exactly the same thing. How, as is her, I how is her position and how is her position in both your cases diff different? Well, new to the Senate. Right. Being new to the Senate, right. realizing that we had cut public ed by $4.5 billion right. last time, restored only $1 billion, the slashing and burning in higher education in 2011, yeah. we restored a lot of funds. So this budget is significantly better right. than the budget that we passed in 2011. And that's why, you, that's why you got to voting yes on the budget. I voted against it in 2009, and I have to tell you, it was a, I mean, 2011, 11, yes. it was a very difficult decision. In 2009, I considered voting against it. Yeah. And it was really very difficult for me, and in the end, I voted for it. Because right. remember that when you vote against the budget, you're also voting against some very good programs. And right. that's the difficulty. You're not voting it. against parts of the right. budget. Right. Against. Against. So and it's that, and difficult. And that does make it tougher. I mean, there was, what, seven Democrats on finance? Mm -hmm. five, I, five, five. Five. I mean, I've spoke to every single one of them about my concerns. Yeah. Uh, and I think the difference is that no, having no input, have not even having enough time to really thoroughly review it. Right. You know, remember, I was city controller. I'm used to digging in. Yeah. I didn't have any time to just, much less dig a little, much less really dig in. Right. So I expect But it was less to, the time than the priorities in the budget. Well, absolutely, to, but I think it's, but it's both, in right. my view. So. It was a smart vote for Sylvia. Yes. You know, our process is that we know that there's opportunities. There's another supplemental Correct. coming around the bend. We know that we're going to address a rainy day fund. So for us, the I wasn't comfortable with yeah. the, the, the education portion. I wish there was more. Right. I was very comfortable with certain things like the increase in mental health funding and uh, certainly uh, stuff that we had put in for veterans and military. That I was very right. comfortable with that. But it was a good vote for Sylvia. As right. Senator, as a practical matter, there are, there are limited dollars in that budget. You know, There may be better times now, and there may be more money available to us thanks to the Eagleford Shale or whatever it is that's saving us economically. From my district. Right. And I'm benefiting from my district. Right. Yes. Thank you, you very fight much. Over that, I'll, I'll sit back and let you all scrap over that. I think actually Chairman Smitherman would like to claim responsibility for it ultimately. But, um, uh, but in any case, there are limited dollars. Many of us at the beginning of the session, given the fact that school finance is in flux, that the lawsuit was making its way through the courts, we're going to have an appeal by the state, we'll probably have a special session on school finance. Many of us thought there would not be additional dollars for public ed, that you all would basically say, we're hitting the pause button. In some ways, a million five back in for public ed is pretty good. It, Where would you have been able to get any additional dollars in that budget for public ed, and what, at what expense would they have come? Well, there's always that, those balance of the interest. 
And so putting in uh, so much on the health and human services side. I think for us, the mental health funding again, yeah. but there are opportunities for us to continue and to move it forward. But it's not the senators all of a sudden have decided we are going to put more into education. People in the district spoke up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether you represent suburban districts, rural districts, or inner city school districts. Yeah. Parents came to the table. Parents about our testing, parents about the cuts to school. And so when the general public cries out, and that was reflective yeah. uh, in certain elections, then we're going to listen because that's who ultimately is the true bosses here. Now the House yeah. senator did put two and a half billion back yes, in for public right. aid. So you all will then come back together and see if you can arrive at a number in common. Will you all and simply say to the House, we'd love to take your number, go ahead and well, do Well it depends who's on conference committee. Yeah. Because on con in conference committee, of course, you work out the differences right. between the Senate side and the House side. Yeah. So I'm hoping that the House will prevail on at least that issue. Right. You want to <laughs> send a couple of weaklings in there and let the House have yes. its way with you? Yes, is that absolutely. what it is? On, 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 in on a couple of again. areas, in a few areas. Right. Uh, on Medicaid, Senator, the reality is that the governor holds many of the cards here on, on the decision whether to expand Medicaid. We know that uninsured numbers, 28.8%, 6.2 million citizens. And Harris County regrettably drives those numbers. Harris County is a large part of that. Your constituents are a big p part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, as a practical matter, if the governor and other state leaders can t outside the legislature continue to refuse to embrace the Affordable Care Act or to expand Medicaid, what can the legislature do? I'm not sure that we can uh, the way the system is set up, but I think what we need to do is just continue to talk about it, continue to raise the issue, and continue to encourage all the advocacy groups that have been down here, uh, you know, telling the governor he needs to act on this. It's been corporate leaders, it's been religious leaders, it's been uh, advocacy groups from all sectors. So I think it's time for him to start listening uh, and start doing. Senator? There's 1.2 million reasons for us to mm -hmm. expand Medicaid. All the financial, the economic impact, the 51 billion that it would cost to draw down the 4.2 billion in healthcare services. But it all begins with a conversation. And I really think that the governor has moved. What we heard last fall uh, was a strict, no way we're going to expand. And then closer to the legislative session, the governor said, we're gonna work with the legislature and see what is the best solution for Texas. And now it's the qualifications. It's, well, let's fix Medicaid, give us some flexibility on existing populations. So I don't, I really am not hearing so a no way, no how. You hear actually what I'm hearing, small movement on this part. I hear, I've got to believe. You know, I know Governor Perry, and although we disagree, I respect him uh, in, in many ways, you know, his staunch, support of the DREAM Act. Uh, I mean, I support that and, and worked with him on, on a number of issues. But I can only hope that his love of Texans outweighs his dislike of the current administration. It makes sense, and I think that if we are able to craft something that yeah. improves our own current existing populations uh, and allows us that flexibility yeah. that there's a way to move it forward, but it all begins with a conversation. And I think the conversations have moved drastically. Uh, a realization that it is good for local communities, it's great for our economies, and why would we want hardworking Texans IRS taxes going for health care for folks from other states? Maybe that's me, a, an enlightened self-interest, but I think the business community is there. And I hear, what I hear from the governor is yeah. not an absolute no. I hear from the governor, let's get a little foot flexibility in our current population and then we'll talk to the Do you have any sympathy, Senator, for the argument from the governor and others that we don't want strings attached to any money that comes to us from the federal government and that the money is going to decline and decline to the point that we're going to ultimately have to figure out how to pay for this after a period of time when the government basically turns the tap off, we're going to we're going to incur those costs ourselves in what has always been an austere budget. We're not necessarily going to suddenly have that money available to us today when we don't, or in ten years, say when we don't have available. To us. What what about that argument? I would say that's not how normal things run. Do we do that with highway department funds? Do we do that with uh, workforce training funds? Do we right. do that in in any other sector? Or think about it in your family. 
I don't know about you, Evan, but when my kids were going to college, did I just give them a blank check and said, here, you do what, what you want, go with it? Absolutely not. You put those limits of prayer because whose money is it? Yeah. And I think that when those programs, I mean, the, the luscious match that we have with the expanded Medicaid makes sense. But if you're putting that much money in, you ought to be able to set some standards uh, because this is all 50 states. So you can't give one state an, an opportunity or more flexibility than you are other states. From what I know is the Obama administration has been very proactive in working with states, with Oklahoma, with Arkansas, with Florida, to work with what do you need to make your Medicaid system work so that you can expand. And I think those same sentiments are true yeah. in any state. But there's got to be that standardization because we are 50 states. Senator, the, there seemed to be in the legislature within the last couple of weeks more of a movement than we saw on the governor's part toward looking for a way to compromise with the administration. And in fact, for about five minutes there, the House seemed to go there and then, then they reversed themselves. the light switch flipped on and then the House reversed itself. And so in fact, coming out of the House budget vote, it actually seemed less likely that the legislature and the state would find some common ground with the administration. Well, but there's still hope. Yeah. And there's a likelihood that we will have a special session. Now, will we get federal money? There's a likelihood that we're going to have one? I believe so. Oh, great. I believe that we might <laughs> over, we could over public school finance, we could over redistricting yes. eventually. Right, yeah. So many of us are expecting it. We just don't know when it so will be scheduled. So if you don't scheduled. solve the problem now, there'll be an opportunity to Absolutely. solve it. Absolutely. But we are not likely to get federal funds with no strings attached, any more than we would provide state appropriations with right. no state, Correct. with no strings attached, as Senator Van de Pute expressed. But there's hope. Right. There is hope because of that special session right. and because an increasing number of members of the legislature are understanding this problem and hearing from their constituents. They're understanding the consequences of not approving Medicaid expansion. Yeah. Uh, let me ask about one aspect of health, Senator, and that's women's health. We started off the session talking a lot about the transition from the federal women's health program to the state women's health program. We had much discussion along the lines of the issues that divided people, Senator Van Pete referred to last session, defunding family planning and Planned Parenthood and sonograms and all that. Not a whole lot of discussion of issues like that. Really the session, if anything, there's been some discussion of restoring funds for family planning and there seems to be actually some consensus developing around that. Um, does the fact that we're not talking about that the last couple of weeks in any big way mean that the issue of women's health for Texas has been solved? Oh, absolutely not. I, th I think um, we still have some more days in the session, and I think we're going to see a co some bills that, that, that will be surfacing. That Give me an example of, of an issue that you think the Senate needs to take on more directly on this subject. Well, I know that, that we're, we're on the intent has already been Duel's bill on the ambulatory care centers, uh, which would be a new requirement for those clinics that, that do provide uh, uh, health services. Right. Uh, that's going to be coming up. It's been on intent now for a week or two. Uh, and there's a couple of other bills that, that we're, I've been watching on women's health. So I think it's still an issue that, that, that needs to be resolved, and I think it's still an issue that, that the state needs to address. Are these the kinds of issues, Senator, that could bring back that spirit of 11 that we saw where you know, it's been a kumbaya session so far, but on this issue, you may see the Senate blow up over. Well, I wasn't there uh, right. last time. Oh, but you so saw. I'm not, I've, oh, you know. I, was, I don't know what to compare it with, uh, right. but I suspect it. There'll be, some, there'll be some disagreement. But I think the reason that that bill has stayed on the intent is because those 11 votes are there to block it. Right. Correct. Yeah. So, so that's why we still have kumbaya, because we can count to 11. Right. Uh, Senator, I'm, because you so, can count so to election, 11, that's it. So elections do matter, and you yeah. know, I'm happy to be part of that block. Yeah. Uh, Senator, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm always reluctant to poke a bear with a stick. No, I'm not, actually. Are you calling uh, me a bear? No, not at all. No, no, no. Wait a minute. I'm speaking in the general sense. That has um, just been tweeted. Has that been Evan tweeted? Evan calls okay. Z a bear. Z yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a Regents meeting today. you have any point of view about that? Yes, I hope that Steve Hicks prevails, and I hope that the Regents vote to turn over all of their emails and all of their documents related to any topic that we have addressed in our public information request will be submitted to us. Uh, Senator, there's been a lot of focus on governance issues related to higher ed this session. What there has not been is a discussion of many other substantive issues on higher ed. In fact, the governance question seems to have sucked all the air out of the room on this subject. What's been lost in the focus on governance, in your opinion, as somebody who knows higher ed well, issues actually, as well as anybody? I disagree with you. You don't I think, I think that the focus should be on governance, because without good governance right. at every university system, we cannot address excellence. 
And the saddest part of all is that this controversy at the University of Texas system that involves some of the regions, not all of the regions, right. but some of the regions, has really distracted us from pursuing our mission of excellence. Well, that's kind of where I'm going, Senator, that in the discussions of governance, there's been this limited amount of time and bandwidth. What's well, we not, what's not being, dis oh, I understand that, but mm -hmm. what's not being discussed while you're discussing those issues are things like, you know, how to make the universities in every system, not just the UT system, better, and how to expand opportunities for kids coming through the pipeline and all that. Well, I it has really been a that. distraction. It yeah. has been a terrible distraction, but an important one. Because I think the Houston Chronicle editorialized today that our attention should not waver. Rest assured. Yeah. I, our attention will not waver. We will continue to address this issue yeah. until it is resolved. And I do believe that it will be resolved. But the issues of governance are so important for our state. Yeah. And we must resolve this. At the same time, we have to talk about all the issues that are important to higher education, affordability, accessibility, efficiency, transparency, productivity, et cetera, et cetera. None of those issues will matter if we do not pursue excellence. Part, right? Well, if we do not pursue, pursue excellence, excellence yeah. because anybody can talk about affordability. Anybody can. And some of the regions are focusing on that. But do you want a cheap degree? Or do you want the best possible degree at the best possible cost? There's yeah. a difference. And so when we talk about affordability and efficiency and cost effectiveness and productivity, each one of those has to be related to excellence. And what is so ironic about this controversy at UT in particular is that the very regions who are demanding accountability and transparency and efficiency from some of the people who report to them are themselves refusing to be accountable or transparent. They're holding themselves to be above the law. And frankly, that is shameful. All right. uh, Senator, let me ask you before we go to questions from the audience. You mentioned the immigration-related bills, mm -hmm. voter ID, sanctuary cities, the portfolio of bills that were so much on everyone's mind mm -hmm. last session. There really hasn't been very much discussion of those sorts mm -hmm. of issues this session, and yet mm -hmm. the population continues to move more and more toward a time when we'll be a Hispanic majority state. Latinos much more in the political conversation, not just in Texas, but after the last election nationally with the National Republican Party making a much more concerted effort to, yeah. to see how they could connect with Latinos. Is, is, it's sort of like what I asked about, about women's issues with Senator Garcia. Have we solved that problem? Is that why we're not talking about those issues? And, at the legislature this time? A absolutely not. So, we, so what's going on? I think elections matter. Yeah. Uh, when uh, Governor Romney only received 20 some odd percent of the Latino vote nationwide, and I think nationwide, uh, we saw that what happens when uh, you pit families uh, what, because of their ethnicity and because of their status uh, of, of legalization against each other and try uh, to divide between us and them. But for Latino population, you know, it's our families, it's our faith, and it's education, it's health care. It's that opportunity. You know, I, I have Republican friends that are, are great Republican friends, and they tell me, you know, Leticia, Republicans are going to go fight for the Latino vote. And I said, that's your problem. You're fighting for the Latino vote. You're not fighting for Latinos. We're not that stupid. Start doing the issues that matter to us, and we'll listen to you. Right. And, and, so, and there's a big difference. Right. And so I, I think that the, the, the want is there to, right. to, to realize that this is about economic development. This is about uh, the future of our workforce. And it's about allowing everyone the, the chance for that opportunity. Uh, it, it is what it is, and though some people may be uncomfortable with the demographics that are, uh, that are going to happen, it's the destiny. It's a great opportunity and quit looking at it as a challenge, but I look forward to it. I look forward to the day when there are Latinas that are Republican in the Texas Senate. I look forward to the day when it doesn't make any difference, you know, that okay, we're saying there's three of us, there's three Latinas. It, it should be that it's a normal course, that our population is totally reflected right. in who is elected to any policy making, whether it's not-for-profit boards, corporate boards, but particularly policy making decisions at the local and state and national level. Senator Garcia, I'm going to let you have the last word on this before we open it up for questions. Uh, Representative Aaron Pena, former Representative Aaron Pena, who switched parties famously a few years ago, said that he believed that one problem that the Democrats had with Latinos is that they, that they took the Latino vote for granted. 
and that as soon as Republicans started getting into conversation with Latinos, that it would actually ultimately be better for the Latino community because when the Latinos are taken for granted by the Democrats, there's not really as much of an effort on the part of Democrats to connect with Latinos on issues in their communities as, as there needs to be. Do, do you think that the Democratic Party has work to do, forget what we've talked about on the Republican side, mm -hmm. have Democrats appropriately addressed issues of, of, of significance to the Latino community or is Representative Peña correct that Democrats have tended to take the Latino community for granted? No, I think the Democratic Party has absolutely addressed uh, our issues. I mean, when you look at immigration reform, I mean, who is leading the charge? Who is really talking about that and trying to address that? It's, it's Democrats that really have started that discussion. And thankfully, there's been some Republicans that have been uh, particularly now, because the wake-up call did come in the last election. And you think it's all politics, so the, the Senator Graham, Senator Rubio, Senator McCain, the people who were talking openly about comprehensive immigration reform, you think it's all politics, that it's not sincere in their desire to fix this problem? I think a lot of it is politics, but you have to remember, at least for Senator McCain, he, he, was, he was about immigration reform before he ran for president. So I think some of that has changed, but I'm really glad to see uh, the other senators now joining. And I think we're going to see some movement on that real soon. Okay. All right, well, let's stop right there. Give these three a hand. Send these back. <laughs>